Hi, this is Phil from Simply Rhino, and in this beginner level tutorial, I'm going to create a simple exterior architectural render with Rhino 7 and V-Ray 6. V-Ray is an industry standard photorealistic renderer known for its accurate results and fast ray tracing. It does, however, have a reputation for complexity, so in this video I'd like to demonstrate how easy it is to create an architectural render in a few simple steps. The starting point for this tutorial is this simple Rhino model that I built for the Using Rhino Like SketchUp videos. To start with, all the building and landscape elements have the Rhino default white material applied and the scene uses the default Rhino lighting setup. The result can be seen here in the Rhino rendered viewport. To start V-Ray, I'll go to the Rhino render menu and set the current renderer to V-Ray for Rhino. To quickly see the default V-Ray proposition, I'm going to click on the arrow adjacent to the viewport title and choose the V-Ray interactive mode. This is a constantly rendered interactive mode that I can navigate around just like any Rhino viewport, and changes to materials and lighting are updated on the fly. By default, the background for the scene is a grayscale environment that is also used for the lighting, but I'm going to replace this shortly with a sun and sky system. It's generally considered better to establish a lighting solution before moving on to applying materials, but in this case, as we have a model that has a substantial amount of glass, it may be better to apply a simple glass material to those parts to start off with. From the V-Ray toolbar, I'll open up the V-Ray Asset Editor. The Asset Editor is a central repository where I can access materials, lights, V-Ray geometry, render elements, textures and render settings. If I click on the small arrow on the left hand side of the Asset Editor here, I'll expose the Material Library and if I go to Glass here and then look for Glass Tinted Black, I can drag and drop this material directly onto my geometry. Once the material has been applied in this fashion, it will appear in the Material list in the Asset Editor. If I now want to apply that material to all of the glass objects in the scene, then this is very easy to do. I have glass panels on various different layers, so previously in Rhino I made a named selection of all of these components to make them easy to select. With these parts selected, I can right click on Glass Tinted Black and pick Apply to Selection. Just like Rhino, V-Ray materials can be applied on a per object or a per layer basis. Next, I'm going to show how V-Ray can automatically create a lighting solution for this scene. Before doing this, I'm going to stop the interactive mode and set the viewport to shaded mode. One of the easiest ways of generating lighting solutions, particularly when geolocation isn't a concern, is to use the V-Ray Light Gen tool. This icon here opens the Light Gen panel and I can choose between exterior and interior variants and HDR or sun and sky calculations. I'm going to choose sun and sky here because this gives me a means of editing the sun position after the initial creation with light gen. I'm going to increase the number of variations and the size of the preview slightly and then I'm going to start light gen and generate variants. As these iterations get generated they appear in the preview pane here. Once the 16 variations are complete I'll set the viewport back to V-Ray interactive mode and if I click on a preview, the lighting solution gets loaded up into my scene, and here it's just a case of picking a result I like the look of. So I'm going to choose this solution. I'm going to look at how I can adjust these results, but first I'd like to back up a little bit to explain something that happens in V-Ray when light gen is used. If I return to the default lighting solution, open up the Asset Editor, go to Settings, and 
and look at the camera rollout, there is an exposure value enabled and this is set to a value of 10 by default. When I load in a light gen solution, this adjusts the exposure value to suit each particular solution. So for the next changes that I'm going to make, I may need to come back to this setting to make adjustments. Moving the slider to the right, lower numerical values, lets more light into the camera and moving to the left, higher values, lets less light into the camera. And small values can make a big difference here. Having set the lighting with light gen, if I now want more control over the sun and shadow positions, I can open up the sun panel from the V-Ray toolbar. This is essentially the Rhino sun panel and from here I can change the altitude and rotational position of the sun and you'll see that the sun and sky are linked to each other inside of V-Ray. As I'm moving the sun position, the interactive render slows down slightly and becomes a little choppy, and the performance of this will depend on your particular machine. There is, however, an alternative scene preview provided by V-Ray that is less computationally intensive, and this is called V-Ray Vision, and I can start it by using this icon here. V-Ray Vision is a non-ray traced preview and whilst of course it isn't as realistic as the ray traced interactive render, it's a lot more responsive and still maintains a link to the active Rhino viewport. So I can move, pan, rotate and zoom and adjust the sun position and all of these changes update instantly. Vision can be indispensable for large scenes. Returning to the illumination, the sun and sky can also be set by geolocation. The method by which this is set is exactly the same as in Rhino. I'll turn off manual control and then choose a location, for instance London, and then I'll set the date and time. As I move the time slider along now, you'll see the shadows move and the sky darkens as dusk approaches. And because of the particular orientation here, the sun also appears in the sky. So I'll set the time to a little before midday. So to recap, there are three ways of setting the sun here. A very quick setup using light gen that can either be accepted as is or modified manually by setting the altitude or azimuth or I can modify by geolocation and date and time. The other important component of the sun panel is the north angle that can be set here and this allows for compensation against the default north position in Rhino which is positive worldwide. I'm going to turn vision off now and go back to the V-Ray interactive viewport. The sun and sky system creates a procedurally generated sky which in previous V-Ray versions was essentially just a colour ramp. and as we've seen, you can see the sun in the sky, but there are no clouds. If I go to the V-Ray Asset Editor, choose Lights, and then select the Rhino Document Sun, I can scroll down and turn on Clouds. I'll then see the generated clouds appear in the viewport, and I can increase the density, variety, etc. Having established a basic lighting environment, I'm now going to apply some simple materials to the rest of the scene. And for the first of these, which is for the concrete slabs, I'll create a material from scratch rather than using a library material. I'll open the V-Ray Asset Editor and choose the Material tab, and then I'll click on the icon in the bottom left of the Asset Editor panel to add a new material. And I'll choose Generic Material. If I click on the right arrow in the Asset Editor, I can see and adjust the material properties. And you'll see that by default, the generic material is a dull, completely diffuse grey material with no reflection. The first thing I'll change is the colour. The slider here allows me to change, in this case, the grayscale value. And if I want to choose from a colour picker or enter RGB values, I can click inside this colour box. This opens up the V-Ray colour picker and here I'll set the RGB range to 0 to 255 
and I'll set each of my RGB values to 195. To add a reflection to my material, I'll open up the reflection rollout. By default, reflection is created with a grayscale value in V-Ray, and when the reflection colour is black, the material is completely diffuse and reflects nothing. And if I move this slider to the right, the material becomes more reflective. The slot below controls reflection glossiness, and this is controlled by a multiplier with a range from 0, which is no glossiness, to 1, which is fully glossy. I'll set a value of 0.6 here, and you'll see that this gives me a very subtle specular highlight on the material here. Finally, I can rename this material and I'll call it slab, and then drag and drop this material onto the relevant parts of the scene. Once I've set up the parameters for a material here, and bear in mind these are really simple materials, if I want to create a new material that is similar, I can right click and select Duplicate to create a new version of the material that I'll rename Dark Grey Render. I can change just the RGB values for this material and then drag and drop this onto the Sun Terrace balcony here. I've now added further materials into the scene, including a couple of newly created materials and a polished steel from the material library. Finally, for this area here, which is the immediate landscape context, I'm going to add a grass material. I'll go to the V-Ray material library and choose ground, and then I'll scroll down and select grass E, and you'll see this has a reference of 200 centimeters. In the preview of the material here, you can see there is a bitmap applied to it because the checkered box to the right of the diffuse slider is illuminated. This bitmap image, in this case a photographic grass reference, overrides the grayscale value of the material and is scaled to be the correct size when mapped in Rhino with a 200cm box or planar map. So that I can see the result a little easier, I'll set the V-Ray Interactive mode in the top viewport rather than Perspective. V-Ray Interactive mode can only be active in one viewport at a time. If I drag and drop the grass material onto the landscape, the material renders immediately. And I can see the texture is oversized and this is because Rhino assumes that the 200cm square texture is stretched across the whole of the poly surface rather than being tiled in 200 cm square sections. I therefore need to set the mapping in Rhino and this is straightforward. The most common solutions here would be either planar or box mapping and if I have the landscape poly surface selected and go to object properties I'll see the mapping tab and here I'll select box mapping. Rhino prompts me to draw a box and I'll set the length, width and height of this box to 2000 mm and I'll make sure the capped option is checked. The texture will now be mapped to each of the six sides of my notional box and tiled seamlessly across the poly surface. And if I zoom in the top viewport I can see that the texture size now looks correct. Now that I have the lighting and materials set up, I'm going to look at adding some content with the Chaos Cosmos browser. This browser is a portal to an online collection of assets including people, vegetation, vehicles, materials and architectural content. And of course, an internet connection is required for this. I'm going to start by adding some people to the scene. And in my first floor layer here, I've created a new layer called People, and I'm going to make that the active layer. I'll use this icon to open up the Cosmos browser, and I'll choose People. And then I can filter the result here and choose Standing. The figures that have the little blue tick or check next to them have already been downloaded. So let's look at using a figure here that I haven't downloaded as yet. So I'll choose Denise and click on the download symbol here. 
Once downloaded, I can click on this symbol here to place the figure in my scene. I'll close off the browser to clean up the screen and switch to a wireframe viewport mode here to make it easier to place the figure in the orthographic viewports by using the gumball. Now, if I zoom into the V-Ray interactive viewport, I can see that the figure has materials and textures already applied and, of course, comes into the model at the correct size. I'll look now at adding another figure, one that has already been downloaded. So I'll choose Paul here and I can drop him straight into the scene and position as previous. Downloaded figures are stored locally in documents in a Chaos Cosmos folder and comprise of VR mesh files, material definitions and textures. I've now added further content with the Cosmos browser including trees, shrubs, vegetation and people. This has been done on a number of separate layers in order to make it easier to turn specific content on and off while setting up the scene. Whilst the Chaos Cosmos content is itself reasonably efficient, adding a lot of trees and vegetation can slow down the interactive render. So once again, V-Ray Vision can be a really efficient way of previewing this more ambitious content. And here, the scene is being previewed instantly as I move around the model in Rhino. I'd just like to make a couple of changes before I render out the scene, and the first of these might not be immediately obvious as necessary. If I turn off some of the Cosmos content here, I can see the horizon line in the V-Ray generated sky, and this looks a little high. So I can adjust the height of this so that it is less noticeable in our scene. To do this, I'll go into the Asset Editor and choose Environment here. And if I scroll down, there is a Horizon Offset setting, and if I move this slider to the right, the horizon is lowered. The next thing that I'm noticing here is that the glass is too opaque, so I'm just going to make an adjustment to that now. With tinted or coloured glass materials in V-Ray, the colour isn't set in the diffuse layer, but in the refraction layer as a fog colour. And this has a depth multiplier. And larger values here will make the fog less strong. So if I increase this value from 2 to 20, the glass will become less opaque and I can now see the internal partitions more clearly through the glass. I can confidently use the interactive mode in V-Ray 6 to preview effects like this because this mode has been improved and the results are now much closer to the final render. Finally, I'd like to make a slight change to the view here. So I'll go to Properties of the Viewport here in Rhino and switch from Perspective to Two Point Perspective. And this is going to straighten up the verticals. Next, I'll just manipulate the view slightly and then save the result in Rhino's named views. I now have everything set up and I'm ready to create a non-interactive or offline render. First, I'll need to stop the interactive render so I can change the render settings, as with a single license of V-Ray, only one render process can be in progress at any one time. I can choose either CPU or GPU via CUDA or RTX for rendering and in this instance I'll use CPU. I'll turn off progressive rendering to use instead the production render which is sometimes known as the bucket render. Don't be tempted to move the quality slider all the way to the right. It's much better to leave this at medium to start off with and then use the denoiser to clean up any unwanted noise in the render. I can choose between V-Ray, NVIDIA and Intel engines, but for now I'll use the default V-Ray denoiser engine. If I open up the panel on the right, I can change some denoiser settings. However, it needs to be said that these can be changed in the V-Ray frame buffer after rendering, so for now the default settings will suffice. In terms of the size of the image that I want to render out, I like the ratio of this viewport here, render 02, 
So I'm going to keep that and I'm going to select Match Viewport and then set the pixel size. I'll set the width to 3000 pixels and then once set, the height will set automatically to match the constrained viewport ratio. I'd like to add a couple of render elements and the first one of these is Cryptomat. This is an automatically generated mat that can be used as a mask if, for example, the image is post-processed in an image editor like Photoshop. I'm going to choose material name in the settings here and each V-Ray material will then be represented in the mask as a flat color which allows for easy selection and masking in post-processing. The other render element I want to add here is Back to Beauty and this is a new feature in V-Ray 6. Back to Beauty creates a folder with the most commonly adjusted render elements, meaning that the final image can be adjusted easily and in a non-destructive fashion. It's perhaps easier to see the result of this later than explain what this does now. I'll now press the non-interactive render button and this will open the V-Ray frame buffer where the rendering is created and can be adjusted. Once the geometry has been compiled, the light cache is created and then the bucket render begins. And the small squares that we can see here are the buckets and each one of these corresponds to a processor thread. Once the bucket rendering is completed, the denoiser pass is created and the image is now ready for any necessary adjustments. Let's look first at the denoiser and if I zoom into an area down here where there is less detail and larger areas of constant tone and toggle the denoiser off, I can see the difference that the denoiser is making here. However, if I look where we can see the internal partitions through the glass, I can see an unwanted effect of the denoiser, a kind of blurring or smearing of the image and if I toggle the denoiser off, these areas here appear much sharper. To remedy this, I can change the properties of the denoiser and recalculate the result. If I go to the properties, I can change the default setting to mild and as this recalculates, I can see some improvement. I can also reduce the opacity of the denoiser effect to get a good compromise between the amount of noise I'm taking out and the amount of detail that I'm losing. And somewhere around here looks better. If I zoom out to look at the complete scene, this looks much better and the smearing effect on the glass has now gone. The first render element I added was the cryptomat and here I can see a preview of the mask and you can see how this could be used to make easy selections on a per material basis in, for example, Photoshop. Next, I'm going to create an exposure layer and the settings here allow me to adjust exposure, highlight burn and contrast. In the area around the front steps, the highlights here are a little blown out or overexposed. So if I pull back this highlight burn slider, you can see that I can now capture more detail in here and lose those blown out areas without adversely affecting the exposure of the overall image. The other render element that I set up was Back to Beauty. If I go to Composite here, I'll see the Back to Beauty layer and all the individual elements of this pass on separate sub-layers. If, for example, I turn off Refraction here, the glass is no longer transparent and if I turn off Reflection, the glass is transparent but loses the reflections. The lighting here is the direct illumination from the sun. Now, most of these settings here are OK and don't need any adjustment, but if I go into Reflection here, I can boost this effect by increasing the multiplier. If I double the multiplier, the effect can clearly be seen, but this is of course a little too much. So I'll set this value to 1.5 to make the reflection adjustment a little more subtle. Whatever adjustments I make in Back to Beauty, I can turn off the controlling layer to view the image without any of the adjustments. In doing this, 
I can see that increasing the reflections has helped and the second floor glass in particular now has more in common with the sky. Having made the adjustments to the image, I can save this image out in a variety of formats. One of the reasons why it's a good idea to make corrections inside of the V-Ray frame buffer is that the image here is a floating point colour image, so we have the maximum amount of adjustability and latitude for exposure correction. This is the final resized image and whilst this is fairly basic, hopefully this will give you some pointers to try out V-Ray and go beyond these very simple first steps. So that's about the end of what I wanted to cover in this video. Thanks for watching and please feel free to leave any comments below. If you found this video useful then please hit the like button and remember that to keep up with all the latest developments in Rhino and V-Ray you can subscribe to this channel. At Simply Rhino we offer training for Rhino and V-Ray so check out our website for more details. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch up with you in the next video.